Let's have one more example of a hypothesis test for a single proportion. Netflix said back in 2016 that about 11% of the 18 to 49 year old age group watched Stranger Things within its first 35 days of being available. Is there evidence that in the intervening years that the proportion of 18 to 49 year olds who watch the show has changed? Suppose that a random sample of 217 adults in that group are polled and 18 of them watch the show. In that case, our sample proportion is 18 over 217, which is equal to 0 0.0829. We need to first state our hypotheses. The null hypothesis is the original claimed value of the proportion, so we're going to say that p is equal to 0 0.11. 0 0.11 is the number that we're calling p naught. And our alternative hypothesis, notice that we want evidence that the proportion has changed. Not that it's increased, not that it's decreased, just that it's not 11% anymore. So our alternative hypothesis is that the true proportion is not 11%. Next, we're going to calculate the test statistic. We're going to need the standard error generated by our uh, hypothesis. So according to the central limit theorem, if the true proportion of uh, adults that watch Stranger Things is 11%, then our standard error is going to be 0.11 times 0.89 divided by the sample size 217, which is 0 0.0212. Then our test statistic again denoted ZC for Z critical is our sample proportion 0 0.0829 minus our supposed true proportion 0.11 divided by that standard error. 0 0.0829 minus 0.11 is negative 0.0271 divided by 0 0.0212 is negative because our proportion is lower than the supposed one negative 1.2783 so that is our test statistic so continuing on with the example we have our test statistic of negative 1.2783. We have our null hypothesis that the true proportion is 11%, and we have our alternative hypothesis that the true proportion is not 11%. So we wanna know the probability that we're going to observe our z-score or something even further away from the mean. All right, well, in the last example, we looked at the probability that our sample statistic was a above the one that we found. However, that's because we were saying that our proportion of heads would have been greater. Here, we're just saying that our proportion could be different. So we don't just want to look at the right tail probability like we did last time. We wanna look at both the left tail, in other words, the z-score is below negative 1.2783, and also those z-scores that are above positive 1.2783. These are the samples that are larger and these are the samples that are smaller than ours. So all we're looking for is different proportions. So we look at both the ones that are smaller and also the ones that are larger. All right, so we could do this a couple of different ways. We could calculate the red and the blue areas separately, or we could observe that since the normal curve is symmetric, we could take one of them and double it. All right, so in a two-sided hypothesis test, our p-value is going to be the normal CDF 
of, we can do the absolute value of our test statistic up to 9999, and then multiply that whole thing by 2. So our p-value is 2 times the normal CDF of 1.2783 up to 9999. 1.2783 up to 9999. Normal CDF of that times 2 gives us a p value of 0.2011. The way we interpret that p-value is we say that if the null were true, if 11% of adults watched Stranger Things, we'd see our data or more extreme 20.11% of the time. So since that p-value is large, in fact it's greater than 10%, our conclusion is there is little to no evidence that the proportion has changed. ran out of room there. All right, well, let's construct a 90% confidence interval for the true proportion of 18 to 49 year olds who watch Stranger Things. We learned how to do confidence intervals a couple of videos ago. Remember that in the case of a proportion, it's p hat minus the multiplier times the standard error up to p hat plus the multiplier times the standard error. All right, well, our standard error with the confidence interval, remember, is based on p hat. There's no hypothesis in a confidence interval. So that's going to be uh, 0.0829 times 1 minus 0 0.0829 all over 217, which is... Point zero one eight seven, and our multiplier is the inverse norm of 95%. Remember that we want uh, to include half of the error when we do our confidence multiplier. So the inverse norm of 95% is 1.6449. So our confidence interval, therefore, is 0 0.0829 minus 1.6449 comma, or times, sorry, 0 0.0187 comma 0 0.0829 plus 1.6449 times 0 0.0187. And this confidence interval is 0.0521. The interval from 0 0.0521 up to 0.1137. And the reason I had us do this confidence interval for this example is I want to show you something. I want 
to show you that 11% is in this confidence interval. The reason that 11% is in this confidence interval is because 11% is a likely value for the true proportion. We judge that because our alternative hypothesis that the proportion is not 11% is unlikely. So the takeaway here is since 0.11 is likely to be P, 0.11 is in a confidence interval estimating p. So there's this duality between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. There are two ways of getting at the same information, namely what values of the parameter are likely. So that gives us the following two correspondences. If we have evidence for the alternative hypothesis, then that means that the null hypothesis is unlikely, which means that our supposed value for the parameter is not going to be in the confidence interval. Well, the one we saw is that we had little to no evidence for the alternative hypothesis, which meant that the null hypothesis is likely, which means that our supposed value for the parameter is in the confidence interval.